Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, my webinar about transformative digital project product management. Um, in this webinar today, I will present to you the modern product management paradigm and how it differs for, from the more traditional models. Uh, more specifically, why today it's actually paramount for every product manager to, to adopt this modern approach and how to apply it in their daily life would be the key to this presentation. We're going to go from a high level kind of methodology discussion to a real life example. So I hope you enjoy um, and that's it. So as we get started, maybe a few words about myself. I am Muli. I am uh, the VP of product management in Glassbox. And previous to this role, I have been um, a VP of product management in other companies. I have been in other managerial positions. I actually started off from a QA position, very technical, very detail oriented. And as a QA person, I got to travel to a lot of customers and I fell in love with solving actual customer needs. Um, throughout the different product management roles that I held, I was actually in different domains, different industries, and even more so important, different types of methodology of execution. So I've been in waterfall companies and I've been in extremely agile companies and I've done functional product management, so to speak, but also very much um, technical product management, data-oriented APIs, et cetera. So with regards to this session, um, I can share with you a perspective that's fairly holistic uh, throughout my career and how I actually made use of the paradigm that I'm going to show you to advance and um, and basically to become a better product manager uh, over time. So with that said, we'll get started. First of all, before we deep dive into the uh, details, I want to share a little bit about Glassbox and what we do. So Glassbox is a company that offers a digital experience platform product. And what we do is we make your customer's digital experience better. Meaning if you've got a product that's a digital product on mobile and web, we will make it better but with our tools. And we service different types of personas. We service UX people, we service product people, but we also service more technical personas. And the reason I'm extremely excited about Glassbox as, as a product and also about this session is because I'm a product manager and I get to dog food off our product, which is really exciting and fun for me. Um, so what does it actually mean? <clears throat> what Glassbox does is it starts by capturing. We uh, capture in a secure way 100% of data of your sessions, whether they're on web or on mobile, and all the events that happen within that session. What that enables Glassbox to do is to visualize in different ways what happens with the journeys and experiences of users on top of a specific product, may it be a web app or a mobile app. So examples would be we've got a journey map that visualizes the different journeys that users take. We've got an interaction map that highlights the um, the areas in a screen that are most clickable, most viewable, um, and where interactions happen. And we, are, we have a lot of different visualizations in the product throughout. And then using all that data, 100% of the sessions that we record, we are able to analyze and surface recommendations. So Glassbox generates a lot of signals for our direct users, which are, in this case, product managers that optimize their products. Um, to have more insight into what to optimize in the experience of their users. Um, example would be struggles that end users experience over our website. And we prioritize them. We tell what the impact of those struggles, et cetera. And eventually, obviously, that information is used to elevate the business results, to increase customer satisfactions, engagement, uh, and revenue for our clients. Basically, their main KPIs as they um, cascade into actual activity within the product and how to optimize it to influence them, that's what we would support in this case. Um, Glassbox is a recognized leader across multiple categories. I won't deep dive into each category, but just um, to shout out a few, you can see here that we got customer journey analytics, mobile analytics, digital experience platforms. And I think the key and what's really important to take away from this is that for a product manager or UX person, um, a developer to be able to execute effectively on top of their data uh, from users that use their uh, products, they need a holistic perspective. And that holistic perspective means that we want to be able to incorporate 
both uh, information from mobile, information from web. We want to be able to screen record, but we also want to be able to, to visualize feedback that was given and correlated with CX. So Glassbox is playing in all those different uh, areas of our space. And as you can see on the right, we have been recognized by multiple awards over time. Okay, so what do we have um, today? We're basically going to go through um, four different sections in this presentation. We're going to start by me explaining what is the new paradigm for digital product management and why I think it's so important. And then uh, after we actually understand what it means, we will discuss the importance of data as the bloodline of executing that paradigm. Without data, it's really not possible. And once we do that, I'll actually walk you through a practical product strategy framework that will enable every product manager to impact the bottom line of their business by applying a customer-centric approach that utilizes data. And obviously, we're going to close off with kind of recapping on our key takeaways. I hope that by the end of this session, uh, a lot of the key takeaways that potentially can seem like a big uh, statements that we all say, but it's hard to connect to reality, will feel really much more down to earth, much more comprehensible. And the importance of following those would be, um, would resonate much deeper following the strategy that I'm going to present. So what is the new paradigm for digital product management? Well, as product people, um, especially for those that have been around for quite a while, it used to be that it was all about shipping product. It was about delivering. And today it's actually more about shipping user value. And what, what does it really mean shipping product versus shipping the user value? So in the past, the emphasis was on delivery on time, the project management element of product management, the um, deep dive into very detailed requirement and building extremely robust product specifications. And it was focused on deliverables and slightly less on outcomes. Whereas today, uh, we are basically focusing on the outcomes to the user. And it actually becomes much more important than it was in the past, which I'm going to cover why. Um, and I think one more uh, point of, of information that's really important is that we used to act mostly on gut feeling and limited data as we made product decisions in the past. And I don't feel that this is enough today anymore. Today, we have to utilize other approaches to be effective in what we do. I know it all sounds a little bit vague at this point, but as we go through this presentation, you're going to understand what I mean when I say that. So why do we want to focus on value and not delivery? Well, <clears throat> first of all, we're living in a slightly different world than we used to, right? Um, not all products used to be fully digital in the past. Um, and then we had a lot of desktop products and then we had web products, but also the business models of, um, of vendors in, our, in, in the tech ecosystem has changed. Meaning today, a lot of vendors offer a software as a service business model. And what happens in a software as a service business model is that you pay a subscription as an end user. And you pay only as long as you get value. It's not a one-time purchase. So users will pay as long as they are satisfied, but they will stop when they're not. This changes things, meaning as a company that sells a product, I'm not only optimizing to sell it, I'm optimizing to retain my client and keep reselling it, so to speak, to the same client. And it really has become as easy as, as it gets today to switch products for our users. So retaining them becomes actually more challenging. Um, I have to say that it's really important that, to stress that this is not only a B2C issue, this is also a B2B issue. There are a lot of B2B products today that are offered as a SaaS model. Their penetration approach to the market is actually to start from the users. And you know you may have heard uh, product-led growth, premiums, et cetera, and then to scale up and to sell to larger organizations. But they're, they're B2B products and they still care heavily about providing user value in order to uh, push their business. And I think finally, as you, you may be aware, 
competition is really tough, meaning in the main category of tech verticals, there's a lot of competition, a lot of uh, different vendors that look very much alike without understanding your users and being able to deliver to the specific uh, pain points or needs of that specific user that ca that characterizes your ideal client profile, we will have extreme challenges in being able to retain them um, and sell to those clients. So with that said, um, what am I pushing for? The framework that I'm talking about is actually designed to make a product manager a strategic person. It's about thinking strategically and thinking what impact can you as a product manager make by focusing on the user value that you provide. Now, what does it mean to be strategic? To be strategic is to think big and we have to connect it back to what is our role as product managers. It's not about only building user stories writing the right specs or executing effectively within sprints. If you do that it's and you're agile, it doesn't mean that you're a good product manager. What being a good product manager means is about making an impact. And the question is, who am I impacting? So actually a product manager is supposed to impact on two fronts. One is their users and internally on the company and the business outcomes for the company that they work in. And impact for users is exactly what we call user value, whereas impact for the company is business results that could be measured by business KPIs. And once a product manager is able to influence business results, it means that that product manager is a strategical one. And that's what I hope that you will get out of this session, meaning how do you basically amp up the impact of what you do to be able to relate it to the bottom line of your business. So let's talk about the strategic value of user value. And I know it's a funny title, but I saw it fit. Um, the way I see it, it's all about consistently providing value. And consistency is really important because we talked about the fact that uh, products became subscription-based and that Users can walk away whenever they want and their cost of switch, so to speak, is fairly low. So if you do deliver user value and you do it consistently, you will be able to impact the bottom line. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be presenting you three, um, <clears throat> three specific business KPIs. And to some of you, it may seem that those aren't directly product related. And it is true that they aren't only related to product and they are owned by other departments in a company as well, potentially. But I think product plays a very significant part to drive those KPIs. And especially in product-led companies, B2C ones, honestly, product is probably the biggest player that influences those KPIs. So we're going to start off with the first one, and that's called cost of acquisition. What does that mean? So Cost of acquisition is the amount of money a company has to spend in order to attract new users or new clients and to convert them to be paying clients. Now, why is user value in the product related to cost of acquisition? So first of all, if part of cost of acquisition is marketing, when your product is delightful for your users and they're addicted to it, they will talk about it. They will tell their peers in the same company that will enable an upsell that's organic, but they would also tell um, potentially colleagues that they have outside of the company and that would push a word of mouth marketing strategy. Other than that, when we as a company invest in a freemium strategy, what happens is think about the marketing funnel, you pay for advertising and then people drop off between the point of being exposed to your product um, on your website, not the product itself, to the point of actually paying for it. But when you give a freemium offering, then you actually reduce the abandon rate between those two steps and you get people to get to play around with the product, assess it, and only then make the decision of purchase. So you actually can potentially um, reduce the amount of money spent on advertising because you are converting more people to try the product. And if it's delightful, they will convert and become paying customers. Um, 
And obviously, other than that, just think about the entire life cycle, you know, support, onboarding, getting a client to use the product and pay for it over time. It all has associated costs. And when the product gives it out of the box, then you reduce that cost. Then when we uh, look at the next uh, KPI, we're talking about customer retention, right? So it's all about in, in SaaS, it's all about retaining your customers, having a low churn rate, and then every growth that you experience as a business is affecting the bottom line, ARR revenue. We all know that companies that have high churn rates uh, are actually really, really struggling in a SaaS model. So customer retention is built on happiness of our customers. And happiness of our customers is built on the fact that they can achieve the value that they want out of the product with is. Um, and that's core. So once we do a good job in providing value to our users, they will not leave us with... Uh, which would translate into a higher retention rate and a higher um, client lifetime value, which impacts the bottom line of our business. And as I mentioned, eventually the customer lifetime value. It's all about optimizing to that. If you look like on the uh, cost graph of acquiring a new client, you actually invest quite a lot before they become a, cl a paying client. You invest at the start when they're onboarding, they have a lot of requests, uh, they're still not fully adopted. And then it becomes what's called potentially a milking cow after a certain point in time where you mostly see revenue from that client. You keep delivering value for them, but they're not as high touch. And when they're at that point, those are their most lucrative years uh, in the life cycle of a client. And you want to increase the span, the lifetime uh, span of a specific client. So the customer lifetime value increases. And obviously with products that actually charge by action, like... Um, could be payment products where uh, the vendor makes some money off a commission. So the more actions that you enable, the more money you would make in actual dollar value, meaning the customer lifetime value in dollars would increase not only in terms of just being able to retain the customer for more time and then they pay the subscription for a, um, for a larger duration of time. Okay, what does that really mean? It means ROI. As a company, um, we invest. We invest in R&D. We invest in support and operations. And we invest in marketing. And we want to see revenue coming in to support that investment. So basically, if you do all the things right and you push the KPIs that I presented before, your overall ROI would increase as a company. It would make you more competitive. It would make you more uh, positioned for your next challenge as a company and your growth opportunities. Um, it's all about balancing the amount of investment that you're making and the amount of revenue that um, that you generate from that. And we have the ability to influence that as product managers. And a lot of product people don't necessarily feel that on a day-to-day -day basis, but that's the actual reality when uh, we do a good job, when we're killing it. And that's what I want you to come out of uh, from this session. I want you to have the realization that you can influence the overall ROI for the company. Okay, um, so we talked a lot about value, and I, I think it's slightly a vague uh, term to an extent. So I want to show you how data fits into this paradigm of promoting user value and why it's really important to talk and use data in order to actually practice this paradigm. Okay. We started off before from the fact that it was all about shipping product, right? And now it's about shipping user value. But then what is user value? So the question arises, what does data have to do with user value? And especially if we want to measure the value consistently, it even becomes more important. Value is quite elusive. I mean, if you try to look for value, um, and if you even go to the dictionary and you look at the definition of value, it's not really easy to answer. I mean, the dictionary definition of value is, is the uh, importance, worth, or usefulness of something. All those terms are terms that are um, slightly vague. And the question is, if we want to make sense of them and we want to be able to measure them, what do we do, right? That's where data comes into play. Data is basically an indication of value. 
And if you have data, you're able to derive the value that you create for your users. So first of all, I think it's really important to touch on the point of that there are different types of data. There is qualitative data. In the examples you see over here, feedback and user interviews are qualitative, meaning specific users provide specific uh, feedback, feedbacks or interviews. There's aggregative data, such as analytics and trends analysis, adoption trends, uh, stuff like that. There is self-reported uh, data, such as feedbacks, and there is uh, inferred data, such as watching a session replay of a specific user. This is a type of data point that's actually both inferred as well as qualitative and not aggregative. And out of the data, we can actually derive two things. We can derive both um, issues, meaning things we need to improve, pain points for our users, but we can also derive opportunities. And both of these are really important. If you think about the product development lifecycle of, um, of a specific set of functionality or a specific feature, it starts off with an ID. An ID is usually based either on an opportunity or a pain, and it follows to, um, to execution and eventually optimizing over time. So. We might start from an opportunity identification from the data, come up with an ID, and then as we start executing, optimize the experience and find the smaller issues that prevent the solution from being tailored to the value that it's supposed to deliver over time. And we use the data for these two things um, in parallel. And if we want to have a good answer to value, we actually need to use all the different types of data together. Doing so will enable us to better interpret the data and to validate it, as well as focus on ways to solve the things that we see. Um, I can give examples. We might see a certain trend and a drop-off. And the drop-off may have multiple reasons. It might be because of an issue with the product, but it might be because of uh, something seasonal. You won't know that without actually trying to validate and seeing what happens when the user uses the product. So session replay, in that case, will give us an ability to see a recorded session of the user and validate if the drop-off that we saw is because of a certain experience or a struggle that the user had. And if we don't find that, we're going to try and find different reasons, and they, they might take us to a different direction. For example, a seasonal uh, effect on the trend that's not related directly to the product. Um, other interesting types of data points that we use as product managers include funnel analysis, the ability to see conversion between steps, journey mapping, such as you see on the top here, on the right, um, and also technical signals. For example, the fact that there was a slow loading time for web page. We want to use all those together to come up with a holistic understanding of what's going on with our users. How do we, um, how can we impact the bottom line with a customer centric approach? So this part of our session focuses on actually, actually applying a pragmatic way of impacting the bottom line of our business with a customer centric approach and doing so by utilizing data. Meaning we're now going to review a specific framework that has specific steps of how to execute this. In other words, what is the, the framework that enables us to execute our product roadmap and make sure that the added value that we create for our users is translated to better business results? Okay, so I'm going to present now a three steps approach that will outline how to execute this strategy using data. And we're gonna start off with the first step. The first step is to identify the key business KPIs that we're trying to push. Basically what's included in this step is both to define the problem or opportunity that we wanna tackle from a purely business perspective. This should come from a a uh, company's leadership discussion. Uh, it can be also influenced from a bottom-up approach, but a lot of time, this is something that the leadership of a company is struggling with to, under to understand 
whether a specific business KPI is underperforming. And we want to be able to define that business KPI in a way that we can measure it. That's first step of this process. The second step is to derive the related product KPIs that influence the business KPI that we're talking about. So it's about identifying the metrics and it's about analyzing the data that we already have to find out what are the current values of those metrics and which ones we think are at the right um, at the right place, so to speak, are at par with benchmarks and which ones we think could be improved. improved. And then once we do that, we want to walk into a cycle of optimizing the product experience to influence the product KPIs that in turn will influence the business KPIs. And what that means in reality is to identify the usage data of our users that are relevant to those product KPIs, to find correlations and identify root causes with the evidence. And um, then based on the, those uh, data points to suggest a solution, a an MVP one, a minimum viable product, and to execute that solution in a build, measure, iterate cycle. Meaning we want to build something, we want to then measure it, see its impact, and then we want to iterate and potentially change our plans. Now, sometimes we actually have to apply a bottom-up approach or at least a cyclic approach, meaning we don't necessarily always know the exact product KPIs that we want to track. We know the area, so to speak, and we have to look at more detailed information to be able to refine our definition of the product KPIs that we want to track. So we kind of combine the top to bottom and to bottom up approach. And we do that by looking at users behavior in our product and understanding how they actually use our product, preferably also by separating into different personas. And then when we understand that, we actually understand also what are the product KPIs we want to track in order to make uh, the overall experience for those users good in a way that would influence the business KPIs, meaning that would push the retention of those users, as an example. And one note that I think is really important is <clears throat> this framework is relevant in general. But for companies that utilize the OKRs framework, objective and key result, I think it's really, really connects into the practical steps of how to um, hook into an OKR framework as a product manager, meaning the business KPI would usually be the OKRs set at a company level, the company objectives. It would be a fairly small set of objectives. And then the product KPI would be the cascading objectives to the departments, in this case, the product department. And then we derive from that the right usage metrics. So if you think about a yearly planning uh, cycle or a quarterly planning cycle, you start off by the company uh, defining or tweaking, if it's on a quarterly cycle, their objective, and then cascading this to the department level and then taking this to actual features and usage data, et cetera. So this entire process that I'm presenting actually happens all the time, and it kicks off on the strategic level uh, at the start of a planning cycle, if it's yearly or quarterly, and it trickles down to actual product metrics that are consistently used and tracked, but modified from time to time as objectives change. Now, I think that we talked about uh, theory mostly <laughs> until now. And I have to make it a little bit more tangible for you. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to examine this framework with a case study to demonstrate how to apply the framework. And in this specific case study, we're actually talking about a fast food delivery company that sells most of their um, most of their orders, so to speak, from digital channels. So it means the, the, that the product manager's role here is really, really important with regards to the business results of the company. And the business problem that they identified, they have quite good metrics at the top level business KPIs. The business problem that they identified is that their customer lifetime value is fairly low. And they do know, which is interesting, they do know that their uh, ratings of food are great, meaning they know that they deliver a good physical product, the food that they deliver, 
and they know that they have a delivery service that's fairly that's operating fairly well and still they see that the customer lifetime value is lower than they expect when they compare it to benchmarks so if we're looking in this uh, and we want to define the problem then our gut feeling is that it's about customer lifetime value and it's also focusing this on how is this impacted by the uh, digital experience of users, because we know that the food is uh, good and we know that the delivery service is good. And customer lifetime value is a business KPI that we'll see in a second that is measurable. Okay, um, so now we start drilling down. We're walking into step number two, which is to derive the related product KPIs for that business KPI, right? Um, to do that, we actually have to first understand what is a customer lifetime value calculation and what are the building blocks that compose it. Okay, so customer lifetime value in the case of a food delivery uh, shop is basically the customer value times profit margin uh, times the average customer lifespan. Now, if we look at the average purchase value, in this specific client, that would be $25 on average per purchase. And it is in line with the industry average for businesses that are similar to this business. And when we look at the average purchase frequency, on average, um, a user would order once every two weeks from this place. That means 26 times a year. And that also seems reasonable when uh, we look at uh, market analysis studies. So we think that's fairly in line. Which means in turn that the customer value is $25 times 26. That's $650 per year. Now there is only one question mark, which is what is the average customer lifespan? The average customer lifespan in this case is 1.5 years. Usually for companies similar to this, uh, it's longer than that. It's not an extremely pricey um, product. And usually customers go and buy from that same place uh, for a lar larger duration. So we want to understand what's actually hindering the customer lifespan um, and driving it down from the expected value. We want to focus on this, but we have to remember, this is still a very much business level KPI and we want to get to the product level KPI. So let's see how we're going to deduct the measurable, measurable product KPI from this. What is the um, customer... <clears throat> average lifetime average lifespan sorry <laughs> so basically this is where we start doing the back and forth between data exploration looking at our data and top down cascading from the top level metrics we want to understand deeply what would be the product api that influenced the average lifespan and to do that we have to do some research and play around with the data so we started off by looking at our different delivery channels of this service. And we found out that within mobile, we have a mobile application and we have a mobile web experience, meaning users that order on the web through their mobile device, not through an, a mobile application. Both uh, In both cases, it's the same delivery service, meaning once you make the order, the same uh, delivery guy and the same service send it over to you. And still, uh, we found that there is a discrepancy between those two channels, meaning one channel uh, was actually generating more um, orders or actually converting more orders from the point of starting a flow of ordering to the point of, of actually making the order. So... Understanding that the delivery is the same and understanding that it's pretty much the same cohort of users, you know, users that use the mobile to order the uh, to order their food, we contemplate that this is possibly a digital experience issue, meaning something is different in the experience of those two um, of those two types of uh, users or in the different experience in the two channels. So once we did that. We thought, well, where, where where do we start? Meaning, if we see that we have a different average lifespan for those two different channels, but we assume that it should be fairly similar, what what actually drives the lifespan? And what drives a prolonged lifespan for a user is the fact that they keep coming back to the product, 
And that's actually based on the fact that they need to have a first good experience. And what does a first good experience mean? Uh, a first good experience is the ability to actually achieve the outcome that you desire from this product, from this experience successfully with ease. So you would come back and do that. Now ima imagine the an experience where you try to order food. It says, great, food was ordered and never gets to you because there is a broken linkage between the systems and it never um, actually gets to the, to the restaurant to prepare the food, right? You'd never order again. <laughs> So yes, a good first experience is mandatory. Um, looking into that uh, good first experience, we wanted to look at conversions to successful purchases because this is the main job to be done by the user. They want to order food. And if we believe that, um, that increasing their average lifespan is built on the fact that their first good experience would be good, then we have to look on the conversion of the specific flow that represents that job to be done, the ability to purchase. So we looked at the conversion to successful purchases and we compare that between the mobile application and the mobile web users. And once we did that, we actually saw that the conversion rate for mobile web was lower than the conversion rate for the mobile application. And we already know that they have different experiences in the mobile web and the mobile application. Uh, the mobile application is much more personalized. It, it remembers some user information. So it streamlines some of the uh, steps. So this made it quite evident that what we need to dive deeper is into is the conversion rate for mobile web users. And that is the product KPI that was decided to focus on. So that's pretty much... Um, kind of summarizing step two. In step two, it's about defining the product KPIs. This is the product KPI that was defined uh, to focus on. And again, if we take it back to the OKR framework, imagine that the company level objective was about customer uh, lifetime value. And then the product KPI was actually increased conversion rate for mobile web users and on their first purchase. Okay, now that we know what we wanna measure, we can go to the execution piece about how to use that information and actually improve the experience, right? And solve the gap. So what are the steps that we're going to take in this case? We still need to know what is the exact pain point that the user is experiencing, meaning we know that there is a difference in conversion rate, but nothing more. We can come up with a solution at this point in time, right? So we have to dive in even deeper than we, um, than we did until now. And what that means is that we have to look at usage data that's relevant to the product API. So we started off by investigating the funnel steps, right? A purchase flow has multiple steps. It starts off from filling your cart, and then you go to providing contact information, uh, payment information, address information. And only at the very end, you uh, basically submit, get confirmation, and the food is you know, heading your way. So there are multiple steps where there could be friction points and there could be abandonment of that flow. And we want to analyze that flow specifically for the mobile web users. What we saw from the data is that one out of five visitors were running into a missing information error, meaning they were trying to make a purchase. And at the last step, uh, they got an error that, that said basically that you're missing information. So after that, we see that there is 20% of users that never try to complete the flow. Exactly at this point, they're already gone. They don't try and fix the forms, fix their payment method, fix their address. They just, they walk away. That's fairly significant. Uh, meaning if you kind of calculate, so one out of five, that's 20% and 20% of that, uh, that's quite a significant rate of overall users out of the mobile web that never finish their uh, their initial purchase, probably not likely to come back and um, and execute on a, an additional purchase, which means that it influences the overall average uh, lifetime of that cohort of users of mobile web. So at that point, we have to ask ourselves, why? Why don't they try again? Why one, one out of five are running into this error? 
Now, if you remember, we discussed the importance of utilizing multiple types of data. This is exactly the point where a product manager needs to dive even deeper and not only look at the aggregated data on the funnels data, but actually look at evidence to really understand what's the pain point for that user. So what happened in this step is basically looking at recording sessions for evidence. This is a digital product. All sessions are recorded. Glassbox provides this capability. So you start looking at sessions. And when you start looking at sessions, it was observed really quickly that users failed in two places. One was the address details and one was the contact information submission. But the error message was only at the very end, not specifying what was missing. Meaning you, the users themselves, they didn't know if the issue was in the address details or in the contact info. We inferred that that was the case because for the 80% that didn't abandon, we saw that those were the things that they were fixing. So the problem of not having a clear indication for the users made it really tough for them to change the information they already submitted, which led to that 20% of abandonment at that step. Now we understand the pain point and we can start coming up with ideas of how to solve this issue, right? Now we all, we all know Agile um, and we all know the importance of Lean in theory, but I'm going to show you now how you use data to actually execute Lean and build true MVPs, okay? So when you, when you, see, um, when you see an issue and you now know what you need to solve, you start coming up with ideas on how to solve it, right? So now in this case, prioritize the different ideas were fairly simple. It's a fairly small issue to resolve. So the first idea was to add real-time validation for each field in the flow. So you don't have to get to the last step to basically find out that something went wrong. Now, the next idea was to improve the UI of how the input information is presented. Imagine, you know, credit card details to separate the different sections of the credit uh, card information to validate according to the last four digits that it's a valid credit card number or date fields, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, step number three was about using auto detect of the address by using the device location. I mean, um, um, we're using, we're talking here about the mobile floor, right? It's the mobile web, but you still can use the device location. And then um, step four and five were about motivating users to actually register so their contact address uh, and payment details could be saved. And suggesting and promoting users through the uh, experience on the web to convert to be mobile app users, uh, where the experience is already personalized, all the information is saved, et cetera. We, as product managers, we don't want to execute on all these steps in parallel, right? So what we do is we want to execute in a build, measure, iterate cycle. What does that mean? It means first to implement one solution at a time, not all of them in parallel. Um, then when implementing a solution, right after releasing it to measure if the, in this specific case, if the conversion rate actually increased. And I, I'm reminding you, we're talking here about the conversion rate of the purchase flow. So on their first experience, which leads them to not come back to the product. Um, if it actually increases, then we want to validate if it actually increases the user return rate, meaning it's actually connected to the fact that it will return um, and, and uh, purchase again. And then in turn, we'll increase the customer lifespan. And then if this is effective and we still want to push that, um, that conversion to a higher rate, then we can decide on implementing the next solution, right? It's an iterative approach and continuing to measure and validate and over time to track the customer lifespan, uh, which, is, which is already the metric that's more related to the business KPI. Now, what's important here is to also understand that we can use data to decide when to stop or if a solution that we thought would be effective is effective or not. In this case, think about the mobile application flow if that flow is converting quite well and it's already providing a personalized experience, 
we can use the conversion rate that we have on that flow as a benchmark to what we want to get at, at the mobile web. And once we get there, we might not choose to execute the different steps. So potentially steps four and five here would never get executed. So overall, this is how to apply the framework that I suggested. And if we if we try to kind of recap, we went through from the start of defining a business KPI right down to how to build a solution for a product problem, but we can see the threaded line in between. So at this point, what I would love is to capture a few key takeaways and stress their importance in context of uh, what I've described. And I hope that it would now resonate much more than as if I was to present those at the start of the, of the session. So key takeaway number one, Focus on user value will impact the business KPIs. Basically, it's all about investing the time to methodologically define the relationship between the user value and the business KPIs. And if you do that well and execute in alignment, meaning choosing to invest in the things that support that relation and choosing not to invest in the things that don't support it, then you will impact the business KPIs as a product manager. Secondly, the relationship between data and value. Those two uh, concepts, they fuel each other. If data cannot be measured, then you basically cannot know, sorry, if user value cannot be measured, then it can be optimized. And that's why we need the data, right? But also the data a lot of time will help us to define better what we think are the value pillars for our users. So it's a cyclic uh, kind of um process, you have to look at data in org in all uh, different uh, types of resolutions, aggregate uh, and qualitative, and you let you have to look at your um, what you would call the value pillars of your users that you can come up with by um, defining persona type uh, user interviews, and you have to correlate those together all the time and cross reference them to come up with a holistic approach of how to drive value. And then the, three, the third takeaway is about connect product KPIs and usage data to business KPIs and strategic goals. And what it means is that the key to effective execution is based on the fact that you're able to systematically connect and explain the dotted line between those different hierarchies of the data that you have, meaning the business KPI, the product KPI, and the actual usage data. And if we're able to do that, then we have an operating framework that enables us to understand how doing some change in the product affects the top level business KPIs. And it actually assists us with removing the guesswork, <laughs> meaning if we don't have that dotted line, we do stuff in the product and we hope that it does something in the business on the, that it influences the business KPI, but we don't understand the direct relation. Um, the next key takeaway is about using multiple data sources to validate your assumptions. So as we reviewed, there are multiple types of data, right? There is feedback data, uh, customer experience data tracked by systems like Glassbox, uh, technical issues like slow responding uh, web pages, inter user interview data. There is direct data and indirect data, meaning that you infer it. Every type of data point gives a different perspective and a different type of hint to a problem or an opportunity that a product manager can exploit. So using all those different types of data together and combining them and reaches the product manager's ability to understand the needs of their users in a holistic manner. And following that, it's really, really important to incorporate both qualitative as well as quantitative data in your analysis. If you um, try to understand what's the difference, I think in general, quantitative data enables you to find a problem and quantify it. For example, seeing a drop off in a funnel, but qualitative data enables a product manager to come up with a suitable solution because they already see what the user actually does or they hear from the user what's the pain point as well as refine the impact of the problem, because sometimes you understand just from watching or talking to a user that without solving a specific pain, it's detrimental to them being able to achieve value out of your product. And obviously, post-release of a functionality 
to be able to use uh, session recordings and to do user interviews is a really good way to validate using qualitative data. Are you choosing the right solution? And quite similar to the previous one, but it's really important to collect evidence. And what I mean here is that sometimes a product manager or a product analyst, they will not know for sure uh, what is acceptable when you look at aggregate level data. Meaning if you got a drop off um, in, a, in a funnel or if you got a drop off in an adoption over time graph, to know for sure if it's reasonable or not, is really, really hard without looking at the evidence. So in order to get to root cause, incorporating evidence is critical. And that type, those types of evidence, again, could be user interviews, could be recorded sessions, could be feedback that's collected from within your product by, um, by an NPS survey, right? Uh, that has free text. And it's really important to use that to validate what you think are um, potential problems and opportunities uh, from the aggregated insight, uh, data. And finally, work in iterations, deliver fast and minimize waste. So this goes back to being lean and practicing this out of an agile framework. But if you want to actually be able to define what's in the MVP, do I go uh, to the next step of enhancing this functionality? What should be included in the next step of enhancing this functionality? Then you have to use data that will pinpoint you to how much value you're creating for the user. It's not only about the ceremonies of Agile, it's actually about utilizing the cycle um, to inform your next steps of development. And the outcome of that would be faster delivery of value <laughs> uh, and minimized waste, meaning you'll choose what not to invest in uh, and you'll choose what to invest in. And overall, you'll invest less to achieve the same level of value for your users. And... This is it. I hope you enjoyed. I do want to thank you all for joining me. And if you're interested to hear more about the uh, digital experience in general, and specifically about how AI is impacting the digital experience world and connect with leaders from all around the world uh, that really care about this topic, it would be a great opportunity for you to join us in digital world. Uh, you can see all the details over here. We got a virtual event on September 13, and you can sign up in our website. So please do, and I will meet you there. Thank you all. Have a good day.